Hello men at Bibb County Correctional. This is Jimbo, your host, along with John Scott this week. We're going to be talking about chapter four, week number four, A Man's Courage. Before we do that, just want to do a quick recap of the previous weeks. Uh, I hope your classes are going well. Uh, you've got some great facilitators, as I'm told. Uh, as you know, we're limited in our contact physically, so we don't have the uh, capability to, to obviously be on site or talk to your facilitators, but I hope everything is going well and I hope everything is progressing uh, farther than you expected. Um, week one, of course, we looked at the story in the persona with the boat builder and uh, how this man went about trying to establish his identity in a certain fashion and basically his entire system collapsed, particularly when things got rough. Chapter number two, life after all is difficult. Uh, we don't need to tell you that. Uh, you know that, uh, but in fact, it's true for all of us. And, uh, but despite the difficulties, we do have an opportunity to determine our attitude and how we respond to those difficulties. So our life does not consist of, or our identity does not consist of the circumstances that we're in, but how we are responding to those circumstances. So I hope after three weeks, you guys are beginning to learn some of this, maybe to the degree that you can actually put it into practice. And today we're going to be talking about a man's courage. So I'll kick it off today and I'm going to ask John uh, the first question that you guys have already dealt with and that is, John, what are some fears that you have struggled with in your life? Well, I'd say probably just trying to assess over my life what those fears have been. It, it kind of evolved um, based on my age. I can think when I first started my career, when I was young, I, I was in constant, I think, fear of, of failing or, mm -hmm. or fear of not performing to the expectation of my bosses. And I really also kind of, as, as, you know, as that evolved, I, I was worried about not pleasing my wife, uh, not pleasing my family, disappointing others if I didn't, um, become so-called successful or not, my future was in question. And so really, um, it, it all boiled, boiled down, it seemed like to me, to fear of, of failure. And this chapter really, I think, deals or focuses on that. Um, you know, the other thing I'm thinking about, Jimbo, is the fact that men, I think as a general rule, don't want to appear that they fear anything that they've got it under control. Um, and I think a, even as young and even evolving in, in my, in my, over my life, um, you, you, you fear that other people will really know what you're thinking, that they will really know that you're sinful, that they will really know that you maybe are not as smart as you want them to think you are. And all those fears, I think, kind of impact your life and how free you feel or don't fear. And, and I think the book, the chapter talks about that uh, can result in what he calls paralysis. Mm -hmm. It absolutely can paralyze you. Let me ask you, John, you just said something that uh, gave me a reminder going back many, many years. And it was this concern that, uh, that we have about ourselves which uh, won't really allow us to reveal what we're going through, what we're experiencing, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the reasons I think that that's true for most of us as men is because if I were to really tell you what's going on in my life, particularly relative to the negative things and the not so positive things or the, the fears or the failures recently that I may have encountered or experienced. 
it will change the way you think about me. And so uh, what, what you said was a reminder to me that that was, a, that, was, that was one of the fears that I had to really get over. And, and fortunately, being accountable with other men helped me through that process because I, I, I want to be surrounded by men who love me, but they're not impressed with me. So it doesn't matter. It's that unconditional love that only God provides for us. But in the real world, the un having the unconditional love of you as a man, knowing that regardless of what I told you, it will not change the way you feel about me. Right, and, and I think what's interesting about that in this chapter is he kind of points out that uh, it can prevent you from having a true personal relationship right. with another man or woman or whatever when you allow that fear to impact how you, how genuine you are, yeah. how open you are in expressing your fears or your doubts or your failures. Um, he, he, you know, he also talks about it kind of may, may prevent you from, from trying to, to, uh, to improve uh, and, and, and taking risk in order to improve. Uh, that you fear failure, so you're not going to take some risk. And you know, some of, some of the most successful people I know are people that that took a risk, but just weren't worried about failing. They just did not have a fear of failing. I've always admired those that started with nothing, and yet were successful because they were willing to have faith in themselves and in God to 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 support them and ultimately became successful because they didn't fear a, a failure. I, I want to mention though also, because this is one of the things I got from, from the concept of fear, is that fear can be good. It can be a motivator. It's just a question of whether you obsess in it. I give you an example. I remember when I first had to give speeches um, I, I would literally shake if I stood to get up to speak. And, but it was because I was fearful of not being able to perform and give the speech. I'd forget what I was going to say or whatever. And over time, I was able to eliminate that, but it was a motivator to me to work harder on that speech. And I just give that as an example that, and I think the chapter says this, fear can be a paralyzer but if you have some discomfort or fear about taking a risk to do something, oftentimes it can be a motivator. It can push you to do something that you wouldn't otherwise do. And if you're always reluctant to accept responsibility or do something because you're afraid of failure, you may never have the fulfillment that you really need in life. And I think if nothing else, I've learned that uh, um, over time. You know, I, I thinking back about what Jesus said about uh, fear and worry, great passage in the Sermon on the Mount in, um, in Matthew, Matthew 6 about worry um, and fear. And so, you know, I would always recommend to anybody that you, that you are impacted by worry and fear that you read that passage because I think it's a great passage uh, of truth about worries and fears in life. Yeah, he, he mentions it on several occasions, and uh, to fear not, fear not, fear not, yet we're, as most of us as men, if we're honest, we're, we're, we're running around paralyzed by fear. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, where, where there's no pain, there's no growth. Right. And so if we're always operating in resistance to what we're fearful of, then it's virtually impossible to grow. And um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a great, great way of looking at it. You know, the book, book also talks about, um, and I think it's from a psychologist, uh, um, Larry um, Crabb, about 
the two basic psychological needs of people, whether it be men or women. Um, what did you find interesting about that and how, it, how you, you compare how, what men think are a need in life and what women think are the most important need? Yeah, first of all, Larry Crabb is, is one of my all-time favorites. Um, and I had an opportunity to meet Larry Crabb and talk to him and actually give him a copy of this book. Uh, it was at a conference that uh, we were both at, and he happened to be one of the breakout speakers. But um, interestingly enough, Larry accepted the True Measure of a Man book as a gift, and I heard from him. He responded back to me, and uh, he, he loved the book. He, he was really impressed with the content. But uh, Larry, Larry mentions these two things, and, and I agree with him. He, he mentions these two terms about security and significance. And um, all of us really, and, and you guys probably can recall from the introduction that I did several weeks ago, that we're, we're all wired, we're all wired for, to experience security, peace, if you will, as well as significance. And this significance is, we can trace it back to, again, the one who created us. You see, God created us for significance. So that, that comes with us. It comes with the package. It's, it's in our DNA, if you will. And, and the reason why he does that is so that we will search for him. But, but what we do, most of us as men, we search for it in every other place, i.e. our culture, our jobs, even our significant others, uh, things like this. So we're, we're searching for this in all the wrong places. Now, with respect to men and women, women have a greater desire for security. And by that, I'm talking about uh, if, if, you're, if you're married, your, your spouse uh, or your significant other is going to be thinking more in terms about are, are we protected? Do, do, uh, is, the, is the mortgage intact and is it paid for? Is there you know, do we have insurance that'll cover uh, a disaster, automobiles, our homes, our, you know, material belongings? So, so females like to have those, a, a greater sense of security and protection. Men, on the other hand, their primary desire out of the two is for significance. In other words, I, I, I've got to know that my life is going to count for something. A la the name of the book and the program, The True Measure of a Man. What does it mean? What does it mean to be a man? How, how do I know? How can I find out? Where do I go to really find out? As most of you know, again, from the introduction in week one, we're told this as young boys. Unfortunately, it never gets defined for us. And so that leaves us to search for significance in our identity in, in, in a variety of places, okay? And that's what gets us off, off course. So women think more in terms of security. Men, on the other hand, are thinking in terms of significance. I want my life to count. I want it to have meaning and value and purpose so that I can lead, not only lead myself, but I can lead my family. You know, I can be the, the husband that God's called me to be. I can be the father to my children that God calls me to be. Well, you know, that, um, that, that doesn't that sort of relate to this uh, idea that the chapter also speaks to is, 
is where we tend to have false ideas about the reality uh, and that is what is significant and what isn't significant. If, I mean, if we're looking for significance, I guess it's a question of where do we look for significance and what motivates us. I, I think about myself, about um, having, and certainly as I was young, my identity, um, my worth, seemed to be totally based on how successful I was in my job mm -hmm. and how I performed, how I appeared to others. Uh, and that, that, that's, a, that, that's a flawed look. And that's one of those false ideas about reality because no matter how much you seek the approval of others, you're never really going to, to, to receive the satisfaction uh, with your identity. You'll always be trying to do more. Um, I also think about the significance is where we try to feel good based on whether we're praised or not, whether we get a lot of praise, whether mm -hmm. we're the center of attention. I mean, you know guys, everybody knows guys that when you get in a group of guys, they kind of take control and want to <clears throat> become the center of attention. And I, I found myself through life kind of seeing that and, and not only at times seeing it in myself, where all they want to do is talk about themselves as opposed to talking about others and having a focus on others. And that's obviously that's humility. And then another false idea, I guess, is, and you learn it over time, is where does your true happiness come from mm. and one of those false ideas of reality is that I'm going to be happy if I have uh, things if I have money if I have a lot of stuff um, or I seek something like alcohol or drugs or whatever to make me feel happy thinking that that's the way that, that I can make myself satisfied and at peace and obviously you learn certainly over time that that's not where true happiness comes from because we're always seeking more uh, and we're never really fulfilled and those I, I think that's the problem with men that folk are so focused on their significance what is significant to them. We all get, I think as we struggle through life, get distracted by what the world thinks, what culture thinks are most important. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's why this, uh, for example, you and I getting together, our group consisting of you and, and me and John and Mike and the fact that we're we're continually in fellowship with each other and we're, we're discussing these things, we're bouncing things off of each other, we're, we're, we're asking questions to one another so that we can keep each other accountable and on track mm -hmm. and, and, and we need that. And when we, you know, when we, when we go it alone, when we isolate ourselves, and, and this is particularly... Which men tend to do. Is, is isolate themselves, I and mean, that's that's part of the problem. That's right. That's right. And particularly when things are going well, because one of the one of the issues there is that that when things are going well, then that the the momentum of that performance is becomes self perpetuating. It it begins to give us feedback. And we, we oftentimes don't think of it this way, but it begins to give us feedback like, well, I must be doing okay. You see, I'm, things are going well and, and progressing, so I, I, I must be okay. But, but you have to be very careful with that. And, and you, you, have to, you have to have a, a foundation that's built on absolute truth that, and, and not feelings or just results that are producing a positive outcome. Well, so, why do you think that, uh, and the chapter talks about this, is why do you think that we all need to come to grips with what our 
purpose in life is. And, and if, you, if you don't have not come to grips with that and work to figure that out, well, what's the result of that? I mean, I, I, and, and I, I was intrigued with that whole discussion about finding your purpose in life um, and some of the examples they gave of where men just gave up, like in the Nazi concentration camp, um, where if they didn't have a purpose in life, life wasn't worth living. Uh, they would, would find themselves going into depression, all those things that can affect, obviously, what your your um, your, your old mindset is. So, what, what? How would you address that issue? Finding your purpose in life. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, I would say that this is this is probably my most favorite topic. Um, and one of the reasons is, is because I struggled with it for so long. And uh, I knew, I knew deep down as a, as a young boy, I, I knew and I sensed that I had a greater purpose than just playing little league sports or then advancing to junior high. I, I, I grew up playing sports and I really loved it and was competitive at it as, as opposed to schoolwork. Schoolwork was right. drudgery for me and I hated it. But uh, so so I tend I tended to measure myself in the field of, of sports. Okay, so so but this stuck with me, this this sense, this urgency of, of greater purpose has always stayed with me. And um, I, I believe it's a I believe it's a, a God given purpose in us that comes from God, so that so that it will lead us to Him, so that He, not Jimbo, so that God will show me the purpose that He has for me. See, one of my problems, John, growing up was I thought it was up to me to figure out what my purpose was. For example, I bought every self-improvement book uh, and course you could ever go through, Dale Carnegie, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, you know some of these, uh, you're familiar with some of that. But it was all an attempt to, to try and find out you know, who, what, what I wanted and how I could get it, okay? And, and it never occurred to me that the only way that I'm going to understand my purpose is to know the one who created me, who has the purpose and the plans for me. So I saw it as something that I could go get and extract from the creator versus getting into a relationship with the creator who who already had put it within me and so that was very that was that was eye opening for me when i had that experience because here's what happened very very simply my my former philosophy <laughs> was jimbo you need to decide what to do and how to get it and when I began to have a, a relationship with him, with God, he began to reveal this to me. He said, no, Jimbo, I want you to understand what you already possess. In other words, how I've already gifted you through creating you so that you can give that away. Now, that was, that was revelational to me. One, one, the former says, me, me, me. What can I get? What can I get for myself? How can I do it? How can I get this? How can it benefit me? The other, the other is totally selfless. It's, it's recognizing, it's going back to the playbook of life created by God and understanding the manual, the playbook, and how he's already created. In other words, it's already in me. 
It's already in me. If I will go to him, he will reveal to me his plan and his purpose that he has for me. That's why I do what I do today. And that, you know, that that's so true. And it's as I think all of us as men struggle with releasing control, putting trust in something other than ourselves. And when we constantly put trust in ourselves, we put pressure on ourselves, we put fear of failing, yes. Yes. fear of not being good enough, fear of not having a purpose in life that will be meaningful to others. Um, but And I think it's hard for all of it, but certainly hard for me in my life to give up control to be at peace knowing that if I if, if I have a relationship with him and seek his guidance, he'll give it to me. And he has. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, also, we're in a habit, I think, at times of wanting it now. I want to know exactly what you want me to do, and I want my purpose today so I can move on. I ain't got time to wait around. Well, that's not the way God works with us. I think it's it kind of leads to that next question that that, that that this chapter raises about how he's we're in bad times is he literally using that bad time to teach me something but if I release myself to him if I'm relying upon him and trusting him to lead me then I'll become more aware of the fact that even in struggles troubles, whatever happens to it, even in our failure, he is going to use that for our good. Uh, and, and, and I know that your chapter talks about that. Um, and I think it's, it's it, again, it's part of that maturation process. We mature as we get old. And I look, again, I continue to look at my life, being among the four of us that, that, that are working on this. I'm the oldest guy. But I can look at my life as a, a, a grow. I've been growing and am continuing to grow with him and learning every day something new. But it's only when I release myself to him, release my control over everything, and allowed him to influence my life, did I finally begin to be at, at peace and not putting so much pressure on myself. Mm -hmm. And then I had the courage, which is what this chapter talks about, to accept whatever happens tomorrow. Um, I, you know, I think about this pandemic we're in, which is a horrible impact on all of us, and particularly on the men at, at, at Bib because of the restrictions and limitations. And you, I know you constantly sit around and think, what is all this going to lead to? Why, why do I have to suffer through this? But I think, I think that there can be meaning and purpose in all of this if we allow him to show that to us. Um, and and it, it's a struggle, but at the same time, we want our freedom. We want to be able to have the things that we want. Um, but there again, he is in control, and we should allow him to act if we trust in him to act for, for our betterment, and he and he does. I mean, I've seen it too many times in my life. Yeah, and this this brings up in closing. This this brings up a very important uh, part that I want to really speak into the camera and and speak into your your lives right now. You may be thinking to yourself, and thoughts may be going through your head. Well, you know, Jimbo, John, Mike. John, uh, you know, you guys are, you guys got it made. You're not locked up. Uh, you don't have any limitations. You got all the freedom you, you need and so on and so forth. But John, John just nailed it down when he, when he said, your circumstances right now at Bibb County are not unfamiliar to God. He knows exactly where you are and what's going on. He's not confused, okay? The question is, really, how willing are you to think about 
examining yourself and how you're responding to the circumstances that you're in right now. Now, believe me, I understand. Everyone who's incarcerated wants to be out. I would be too. Okay, so I, you get no argument from me there. But here's what I want you to really think about and focus on. The time that you have right now, and you've got time, how are you going to use that time? Okay, how are you going to use it? Because let me tell you something. It's your choice as to how you use it. And I can tell you this because I've seen it in the lives of other inmates, that if, if you will invest your time wisely, into the playbook of life, as I call it, into God's Word, and also associate yourself with other godly believing men. You will begin to experience transformation in your own life. Now, that's a call that you've got to make, but rather than thinking about when you get out that you're going to make these changes in your life, don't wait, men. Don't wait. Use the time that you have now so that he can make the change in your heart. And once that change is made, your behavior will follow behind that. So, and, right? and, and isn't that what the chapter refers to as learning to respond in a positive way to the negative circumstances you're experiencing in your life? It is. As opposed to responding in a negative way, beating yourself up, feeling negative, feeling depressed, whatever, find a positive way, which is not easy, but finding a positive way through his help, through God's help, to respond when you're facing negative circumstances. And we all do, obviously, from time to time. That's right. It is. Well, John, I've enjoyed it. This week, uh, we'll, uh, Mike Clark and I will be back next week to open it up with Chapter 5, A Man's Truth, one of, the, one of the best chapters in there. It's got a lot of meat in it. And uh, so you guys study up, read up, uh, whatever questions, again, that you may have above and beyond the questions for the week, please let your facilitator know. They're there to help you, to have a discussion with you, to help iron out any issues that you may have. So, hey, we love you. We look forward to seeing you next week, and God bless you.